So without further um, delay, Susan Calder has published five novels with Alberta genre publisher BWL Publishing. Four are part of her Paula Savard mystery series set in contemporary Calgary. The fifth is a standalone psychological suspense novel. She is currently working on a historical murder mystery set in 1918 Calgary. Susan is a co-chair for Boucheron World Mystery Convention, which will take place in Calgary in October 2026. So please mute yourselves and give a warm welcome to Susan Calder. Okay. Uh, thanks, Julie, and thanks for organizing this, and thanks to all of you for coming. I see a couple of relatives here and, and friends from Ontario, one from Montreal, who couldn't come to the book launch. So I thought this would be a great chance to, to give them an opportunity to hear me read a little from this book. Um, I'm going to read from my newest novel, Spring Into Danger. This is it here. It's the uh, fourth book of my Paula Savard series, which is set in uh, Calgary. Uh, a little introduction to Paula. She's a sleuth. Uh, she's my main sleuth in all my books. She's an insurance adjuster in her mid fifties. Uh, in the first book, she stumbles onto a case by accident and her success in solving the crime leads her to carve a niche in, uh, in a dealing with insurance adjusted, insurance related crime uh, cases in the next two books. But in book three, her case went rather sideways and she was quite upset at the end and she's vowed not to get involved in any more dangerous cases, which set up a problem for me when I started book one, because she didn't want to leap into the case as she did before. But I had to seduce her into solving the crime by presenting it initially as a rather routine insurance case. So Spring Into Danger begins in April 2020 at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. I started writing the story about a year and a half later, but I wanted to write about that earlier time in the pandemic because enough distance had passed that I wanted to process that experience of when the pandemic was new and frightening to us all. So Paula works in a historic building on Inglewood's Ninth Avenue in Calgary. And at the start, she's alone in the building working. Uh, and this building is rumored to be haunted too, so it's a little bit creepy. Um, because everybody else in the building is either working from home or the business has shut down due to the pandemic. So I'll read from the opening scene in the novel, which might bring back memories of your early pandemic days. Chapter one. Paula Savard missed her colleagues she wished she and her boss hadn't been forced to let one go, but their insurance adjusting business was drying up. Her remaining two colleagues had opted to work from home when Calgary shut down over five weeks ago to curb the spread of the COVID-19 virus. If the pandemic dragged into summer, Paula doubted their company would survive. A message appeared in her email inbox, subject line, new claim. There'd been a break and enter at a bicycle store discovered this morning. The insurance agent wrote, Detective Mike Pincelli recommended we assign you the claim. Interested? That explained Mike's phone call and request to drop by her office on his way home from police headquarters. He'd arrive in about 20 minutes. Paula opened the attached police report. Thieves had broken into cycle life after it closed the previous night. They'd made off with two electric bicycles and numerous bike accessories. No injury noted, no staff on the premises at the time. The owner's attached statement confirmed the police details. So why was homicide involved? More importantly, why would Mike involve her? She told him she was finished with suspicious death cases. Mike had said he understood. Paula left her cubicle and crossed the reception area to the kitchenette to make a fresh carafe of coffee. Even though she'd washed her hands when she arrived at work and hadn't come close to another human since then, Paula gave her fingers and palms a thorough scrub, humming happy birthday twice, which her mother had nagged her to do when she was a child. Happy birthday to you. Paula's 56th birthday was next Tuesday 
and she was supposed to be in Germany with her partner, staying in a castle hotel and touring fairy tale esque German towns. She'd also planned to spend two weeks in Hamburg, where Sam had moved for work, to see if she would like living there part of the year. He'd started his new job with a European architecture firm weeks before the virus shut down the world. Now they were stuck, an ocean and two half continents apart. Paula dried her hands and then exchanged the towel for a clean one for Mike. The ever-changing health protocols bugged her sometimes. According to the current rules, they shouldn't be meeting inside since Mike wasn't in her household bubble. Less than two months ago, she hadn't known what that term had meant. She set the coffee machine to brew. As she passed the reception desk on her way back to her cubicle, she heard the entrance doorbell ring. Mike's voice came through the intercom, his words garbled by static. She buzzed him in and went to the outer hallway to greet him. Footsteps sounded on the lower staircase. This was Mike's first visit to her company's office in Inglewood. Mike's head appeared above the staircase railing. He reached the landing, passed the doors of the real estate and optometry offices, and stopped more than the requisite two meters from her. 36 old, years old and six foot four, Mike was dressed in a blue suit, his detective clothes. Paula hadn't seen him since February when they were unaware of the COVID-19's impact. Now his dark hair grew shaggily over his ears, thanks to the barbershop closures. How do you like your new location? Mike asked. She followed his gaze up to the scallop moldings that underlined the 12 foot ceilings. It's got more character than our old place. The date on this building says it was constructed in 1911, he said, and stepped a half meter closer. Is that a new scarf you're wearing? Paula looked down at the silk scarf around her neck. My mother gave it to me for Christmas, she said. Odd. Mike had never commented on her clothing before. So as the story goes on, we learn the significance of this scarf. It's, this one's a little silky and butterfly too. So thank you, thank you very much. And uh, so I guess we could ask some questions if anybody has any. Yes, is there anybody that has, ah, Jonathan. Um, I really enjoyed that, Susan. Uh, thank you. you, I've got a very, very quick question. And it's actually, a, it's a kind of writer question. Like I've, uh, uh, I've been asked the question and it's uh, and it's been asked lots and lots in the sort of uh, you know, uh, preceding few years since the the pandemic um you know what was what was your thinking behind setting a book it, it you know, during covid certainly at the sort of start of the of the, the kind of lockdown because i know that a lot of authors have said that uh, it it seems to very much it, it divide people that i've I've, that I've spoken to anyway within the industry it's 50 50 you know some people um, just will pretend it never happened when it comes to their work. Other people, absolutely, that's where they want to set the next book or the or or or, or have already set their next book. Um, I'm just I'm always curious as to as to wonder, you know, the the the, the process behind thinking. Right, you know, this is this is when I'm going to set it. Okay, thanks for that. Um, well, I always like to set my books in a real time and place because I do feel part of it. It is. It records the time and place and has things really are. So I really wouldn't consider setting it during a time that was obviously during the COVID period without referencing it in some way. And a problem I had is, so I didn't want, I couldn't really set it in the future after COVID because I really didn't know how the world would be after COVID. I used to think and the world's not going to change all that much significantly for my kind of stories, but that hasn't really been so in COVID. You know, I re we really don't know how we'll connect with each other and things like that. So I wanted to set it in a time of COVID that was there. And as I mentioned earlier, I just felt like I wanted to process that beginning period and really feel what it was like and intensely with the lockdown. And it was a little almost like writing historical fiction because a year later, so much had changed and I had to research it to see what was open, what was closed. And sometimes I'd be writing and I'd forget. I even had, in my first draft, had, let's meet in a coffee shop. And then I said, no, it's closed. And and so it was it was interesting to do it. And I wanted to just record that time period for uh, 
for people to remember and, and see because it real it was real and it's affected us and still does. Great answer. We have a great question. Great answer. We have another question for from Bernice Pike. Susan, are you done with Paula or is there a chance of another Paula story? Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Bernice, for as asking that. Um, I don't know. I, I've, I, as I said, I, I'm writing a historical novel now, so it's not going to be my, my next novel. And I'd like to continue with Paula, but I feel like I'd more like to try some other things too. So I really don't know if she'll be be back again, but I don't want to say no for sure. So that's not a very conclusive answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm being evasive. I feel maybe when I'm young, if I was younger, I'd like to write more and more Paula books. But uh, now that I'm a little bit older, I might like to try some other things. Okay, any other questions for Susan? All right. If something comes up, we can ask at the end. So our second reader is Tony Thompson. Tony was born and lived most of his life in Nova Scotia. He retired from 34 years of teaching sociology and criminology at Acadia University. Among other topics, he researched small town and rural policing in the Annapolis Valley. This work included in-person observations interviews and at times participation. After decades of writing academic nonfiction, in 2022, he published his first novel titled About Face, a mystery set in the Annapolis Valley. Last April, he and his wife, Heather Frenette, moved to Medicine Hat. So let's welcome Tony. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and for organizing this. And thanks also for everyone who's joined us. It's great to meet some of Alberta's prolific crime writers. Uh, one novel doesn't add up to much yet, I guess. Um, up to now, it's been entertaining. So we'll see, hey? uh, see how I do. Um, some For someone who talks for a living, I do find it a bit intimidating. Uh, writing a novel was a remarkable experience for me. Um, so I want to give a little context to the book and offer some partial disclosure. Um, it's, as Julie said, it's a boat face. Uh, the, it's set in Nova Scotia. Um, in 1999, in fact, uh, which probably is pre-COVID. I chose a genre I knew well, uh, but wanted to change a bit. Um, I began with a few plot lines and themes and found a style that suited me. And I took the advice uh, from another writer and said, okay, well, I, if I'm writing for the first time, I should write about something I know about. S serious issues come up in the book but uh, a lot of jaundiced humor as well, and social commentary on rural RCMP policing. Mysteries are plot driven, but novels are also about character and theme and setting. And I wanted, I, they're important to me. And, but as I wrote, I became aware of how the plot was taking over. The main character is basically an anti-hero. Um, no one is supposed to emerge from the book unscathed. The plot builds to a, an action climax, but it ends unexpectedly. Some loose threads are not fully sewn. So the reading I've chosen begins the second chapter. Um, you know, early reading protects the identity of the presumed guilty. Ian Wallace, the main character, has just finished a morning, an eventful morning, on highway patrol with a constable, an RCMP constable. And he's returning to the college where he works for lunch. Chapter two, good fare. 
entering through the back door of the Arts and Administration building, I resumed the less remarkable part of my split life. I was usually happy to go into the college, even more now I lived alone. But this abrupt change of roles always left some lingering tightness in my core. Andy hadn't stopped all morning for a break at Tim's, and there wasn't time to make the noon hour basketball scrimmage. So I entrusted my lunch and health to the grab and gag cafeteria, officially the grab and go. I couldn't tell how many hours the pizza had been sweating under the warming lamp. I hoped long enough to confess its worst microbial sins to my olfactory police. I elected a mushroom and dried tomato veggie slice, self-smell and serve with a small dark roast to smooth its way down. Looking for a comfortable space away from the gaggling students, I spotted Robert Teasdale signaling discreetly from a quiet corner table. Should I pretend not to notice? Would he feign not to be offended? Feeling ensnared, I waved in his direction through the leg and sneaker obstacle course. With a straggly white goatee, pale skin, I had a tightly curled silver, silver hair and light colored eyes. Everything above Robert's neck practically disappeared when he stood in front of a white background. His shirt, his gray shirt, showcased his crimson tie emblazoned with miniature college crests, trying to be natty as usual. Of all the faculty in the department, only Robert had voted against hiring me. Not that I was supposed to know, but that kind of information permeates the college like the dust from the chalkboard we still used. Robert thought they should, they should have brought in another American or someone who knew how to dress properly. Even so, my feelings about Robert aren't under the bridge. They're more orange, low tide mud, still visky and gummis, gummy if you find yourself wading in. Resentments die hard. Hey, Ian, Robert greeted me with what he hoped would be taken as a friendly come and sit. Anything new? Vague generalities were all I owed him. I just finished a stint on Highway Patrol. Not much happened, I added in hopeful discouragement. My answer nudged his thinking only slightly to a follow-up I'd hope not to hear. You still doing that police thing? I thought you'd finished that ages ago. Have you published anything yet? Robert was on the tenure and promotion committee where he played the hard-nosed cop, one of those who kisses up and kicks down. His question had a disparaging sneer I had to answer. I use what I learned from my research all the time in my teaching. Stories add meat to the bones. While I was delivering this takeaway, Robert's gaze had flitted to a group of women crowded around a nearby table. According to the scuttlebutt, Women students complained about his attentiveness to more than their grades. It's no consolation being under the objectifying lens of the male leer to be told looking is safe because it substitutes for action. Too often it doesn't. One of our women students has been reported missing, I said. I hope she's not one of mine, Robert said quickly, before abruptly returning to his own thread. Nobody gets promoted just for teaching, Ian. It's a popularity contest, you know. Who is the most entertaining in front of the class? Student evaluations are a joke. This conversation was going to no galaxy where I wanted to hitchhike. You hope she's not one of your what, Robbie? One of my students, of course, he replied with an edge, glaring at me while turning a shade more pink than white. He began stacking his disposable dishes 
and abruptly pushed back his chair. Well, I said, finishing what little of a slice I could. I have to prepare a new stand-up routine for today's class. Robert walked away without responding to my passive aggression. I took the stairs to the social sciences department and my office refuge, thinking about how important humor is in a lecture. Most of mine is spur of the moment, the riskiest type. Thanks. Thank you, Tony. Sorry, I had to find my unmute button. Um, does anybody have any questions for Tony? Sorry, I'm just looking in the comments here. Okay, I thought there was one that popped up. Uh, while we're waiting to see if anyone else, uh, I did you do your cover art or did someone else do it? I absolutely loved it. Uh, when you showed us there, it really grabbed my attention. It looked kind of like uh, a little abstract, um, but definitely the darkness was there that pulled me in. Uh, tell us about yeah. where the artwork came yeah. from. Yeah, the darkness is there. And what I wanted was uh, something cubist. Um, the, the artwork was done by my son. He's oh, wow. a graduate of the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. and He very happily agreed to do it. And uh, I, I'm quite proud of the cover. Uh, I think it makes the book. I concur. That's fantastic. You were able to collaborate mm. with him. Yeah, no, he was really happy about it. So that, that oh, was I bet. Really, I that's was... really exciting. Yeah. Um, any other questions for Tony? Okay. So I'm going to go on. But if you come up with a burning question, don't worry, you can ask. So next is me. And I'm not going to read very long. It's going to be short. Um, so I'm Julie Heiner. I hang out at killersanddemons.com and I write both dark crime and horror. So my crime series is what they are is a deep dive into the consciousness of both the serial killer and the detective. So it's like Criminal Minds or Mind Hunter, where you see the story from both sides and you see how it comes together. My books, the first three in my series are set in the late 80s in Calgary, and they are a fusion of music and storytelling. So the first book, which I'm going to read from tonight, is uh, the the wild heavy metal uh, MTV videos of the late 80s are a critical part of this story and the murder scenes. So the murder scenes are emulations of said videos. Um, I'm going to just jump right in and I'm going to just read a very short bit about halfway through because it won't give anything away. But where we are is we're at the third murder. So now it's officially a serial killer, even though it was pretty obvious. And what you'll get from the scene, I'll jump to the part where they're approaching a cave in a ravine behind a neighborhood where a body has been found by a couple of teenagers. And we'll get a feel for what the detective is dealing with, but also the strange messages that are being left by the serial killer trying to recreate some kind of dark fantasy. Um, and where we are is uh, Detective Mahoney is the lead detective and Blackwood is the medical examiner and she's accompanying him in this particular situation. They've arrived at about the same time, so they are going toward the cave together and both probably simmering in what they're going to find. And Mahoney at this point is also starting to suffer from uh, hallucinations of cases from the past and even the bodies from the recent case. Mahoney led the small group across the wet grass toward the tunnel. Crouching over, Mahoney stepped into the darkness, a wave of cold chilling him. Snapping his flashlight from his belt, he flicked it on. A tingling crept up his arms, then down his legs. Where the hell does this go? He plunged his gaze as far as he could into the darkness, his flashlight only scratching the surface of what lay ahead. His heart pounding, his forehead grew moist. What the hell did this guy leave for us this time? His mind raced through the dramatic images plastering the cream-colored crime scene wall back at HQ. 
Coming to the other end of the cylindrical passageway, he stretched himself back up to full height. Watch your heads here, he crisply instructed the rest of the team in tow. Imprisoned in a small spherical cave, he scanned his surroundings. As Blackwood stepped through the opening, the powerful lumens of her Sunfire Six brought the scene to life. His eyes followed the bright beacon as she moved the light slowly along the wall of the dark dungeon. The light halted, illuminating a gory discovery. A body perched against the wall, directly across from them, crouching in an eternal pose, knees bent. The head was positioned forward, straight toward them. In stark contrast against the darkness, a savage tiger mane voluminously sprung from the body's head. Wild stray pieces of orange red pierced the blackness. Tangled thick strands snaked their way down an ashen face. A single glassy eyeball glared at them, its vacant stare piercing through the mess of hair. Mahoney was jolted by a vicious vibration weaving its way through his body. Geez, his mind took the lead. This scene belongs in a nightmare, a horror film. Not here. Not here in the backyard of a row of quiet homes with picket fences. The upper body was clothed in a jacket of rugged, yellowing textile. Full-length sleeves encased the arms, wrapping their way around the torso in a desperate hug, pulling the hands behind the back. Blackwood's flashlight threw a glint off a shiny silver buckle. Blackwood and Mahoney walked closer to the figure, side by side, the powerful light guiding them. Arms length in the body, a spattering of buckles became visible. The fasteners were strategically placed along straps, enabling a suffocating grasp on the caged body. A chilling realization washed over Mahoney. Holy shit, he led them in the first conclusion, echoing the thoughts of all minds present. It's a straitjacket. Blackwood directed the bright lumens down the body, completing the initial scan. Jet black, skin-tight pleather encased each leg stretched to the limits by the bent knees, the carcass beneath threatening to burst free. White bare feet smudged in oily mud sprouted from the openings in each black pleather leg. Dark red lacerations ripped apart the flesh of each ankle, scarlet globs clinging to the cuts. Blackwood leaned in as close as she dared, pushing aside the solid mass of tangled orange. All eyes fixated on the ghost face staring back at them, caked in a thick white mask like a sculpted bust carefully built with layers of plaster. The face continued to stare back at them vacantly. Thin black lines emphasized each of the glassy eyes, lids shimmering with silver dust. The thin, slightly parted lips painted a soft peach, tightly drew back in a mild scowl. Mahoney lifted his tingling hand toward its usual resting place, stroking the rough bristle. Blackwood broke the silence. Looks like a similar paint job to the other two. That's some hairdo. Blackwood's plastic-wrapped hand slid slowly downward, moving the stiffness of orange mane away from the neck. Spherical contours stigmatized the bloodless neck, weaving their way around like a deadly snake, viciously restricting its prey of life-giving breath. The soft white skin turned putrid. The ligatures were the color of wet, rotten leaves covering the cave floor. Mahoney shook his head. This is the work of our guy. Blackwood's hand released the wild tangle, reaching toward the orange-red strands plastered to the forehead. As she moved away from the sticky, sticky mess, a new world of horror was revealed. A series of letters immortally carved into the skin formed the assertion, I'm gonna watch D bleed. The slices putridly plunged into the flesh, once oozing with vital liquid, now caked with desiccated crimson, clinging to the edges of each symbol. A flush of adrenaline coursed through Mahoney's veins, pins pricked at the nape of his neck, migrating down his arms, the hairs responding by standing at full attention. A trio of linkage stared him down, confirming the path that his gut had told him he was on as soon as he saw those pink, muddy boots. The black vortex closed in on him, pulling him down a swirling path to its dark center. So just to give you a little, oh, I don't know, because I've got this like funky thing, but uh, I do, my custom design books are meant to look like uh, the time era and the music, and they are different than the ones that I have online. So does anybody have any questions about my gory uh, scene or anything else? Jonathan.
Uh, I feel it's such a pest by by asking oh. all these questions. I do apologize. No. Um, Julia, I wanted you to tell us about the uh, your new series that you've just signed a very exciting book deal for. I did. Plug, 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 plug. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I have started writing horror short stories and novellas, and I have primarily self-published, except for some short stories. And what Jonathan's referring to is I wrote a deep sea horror novella, and it yeah I, it has been I've got a publishing deal with Crystal Lake Publishing which is a really well-known publisher in the horror world and thank you Jonathan I'm really excited because this was a huge step I've published a lot of stuff by myself and this is a really exciting step for me and I've always found even my crime I agree with a lot of what Tony said uh it's about characters and setting and emotion and feelings and horror to me is is emotion and the deep sea is terrifying and so it is a very character driven book it's set in san diego and it's in the mid 80s and there's something in the ocean and it's not a shark <laughs> and i'm just going to scroll down the okay are there any other questions okay so for now we will move on and we will go to susan wright uh susan studied anthropology and architecture before becoming a lawyer. She worked as a litigator at a national law firm, then moved in-house with a multinational corporation. Her work has taken her from the boardrooms of Houston to the streets of Hong Kong. When she's not writing, she's traveling with her husband and two daughters. Her favorite vacation was a trip from Prague to London on the Orient Express. One day, she'd like to take the train from Venice to Istanbul. Welcome, Susan. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who's here. Um, the uh, the books that I write, I've written three. This is my third one here uh, that I'm going to read from, Fortune Favors the Dead. And I just launched it uh, last week, actually, at Owl, Owl's Nest. And their protagonist is a, a young lawyer. She's in her late 30s. And um, uh, she's, not, she's not as conventional, let's put it that way, as I was. And so her her stories take her into different worlds, and she she uh, explores those worlds logically, but also with a passion for justice. And as we've seen over time, uh, just because something's legal doesn't mean it's just. And so this is something that she she grapples with at times where she's she can feel herself being pushed a little too close to the line, and she needs to think about how she wants to manage something. And it sort of picks up on that point that Tony made that. Often characters in books are interesting because they they have to deal with certain things and, and come to um, some way of reconciling themselves with what they see around them. So anyway, uh, my main character is a, a woman called Evie Valentine. She's she's living in Calgary with her sister. Um, her sister's moved in with her after her, her uh, a really bad divorce. And so Louisa comes and joins um, Evie at her place bringing along her great big brood of a bull terrier dog, Quincy. And the, the three of them find themselves in certain situations that, um, that, that, that form the root of the book. In this book, unlike the other ones I've had, like I've, I've talked about um, great big corporations and what they can get themselves into. I've talked about politics in my previous books. This one actually addresses the world of academia, universities, dusty old law, um, uh, halls of, of universities, and also mining. And, and I was thinking about how things are not what they seem. Often when you look at a situation and you meet somebody, there's an awful lot of layers of things underneath them. That's not what they see, they are, they're seeing. One of the things we cover in this book is um, amylite mining. This is an amylite stone and it's actually Alberta's gemstone. And it's not a gem at all. It's, it's actually a fossilized uh, sea creature that's been gone for 75 million years. And it was one of those things that made me think about how one thing can be something else. And this this stone is is basically um, sold as something that will will bring you the knowledge of the universe because it's been there for so long. And the ones that that are mined in Alberta actually are very are quite rare compared to the ones that you can get anywhere else in the world because ours have got blues and violets and other interesting colors in them. So anyway, those are all kind of in the background to to the story. And I'll read from the first chapter, which is where um, Evie and another university prof um, are, are trying to put together 
a celebration for her favorite law prof and mentor, a guy called Finn Tanberg. And they put this thing together in Banff uh, at a very swanky place. And so we'll just kick off from there and then we'll just, I'll just read this part for you. So while Hadiza Paramar raged at the chef and I suggested that we substitute fiddlehead ferns for wild asparagus because yelling at the poor man wasn't doing any good, Finn Tanberg lay dying behind a dumpster at the Banff Springs Hotel. This all happened two hours before he was supposed to appear on stage at a gala event celebrating his, his retirement from the university. An evening with Finn Tanberg was, in Finn's opinion, an overblown pompous affair. What started as dinner with a few close friends and family blew up like a wedding run amok. Now it was a formal banquet with 120 academics, environmental activists, students and former students coming to Banff to honor my former law prof and mentor. He hated it. His son, Peter, was adamant. Dad, you're in transition. You're not shuffling off to a senior's home. It's not, here's your gold watch, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. You're a hotshot consultant now. This is huge. It needs a big promotional push. Peter always talked like that. Promotion should be his middle name. He was brilliant and highly educated like his father. He'd obtained a PhD in material science from Sanford, but that's where the similarity ended. Peter flat out refused to follow Finn into academia. The very idea of burying himself in a dusty old university horrified him. Ever since he was a kid, winkling money off his dad's friends by doing math problems in his head faster than they could, he'd had his heart set on becoming an entrepreneur preferably a rich one. Finn hated the idea of fancy dress dinners. It was too flashy, too expensive. What's next, he said, bouncy castles and clowns. We ignored him. We wanted to make it perfect. That's why I spent the last afternoon of Finn's life persuading a chef to go with fiddlehead ferns. Yes, it's a Canadian cliche, but we had no other option before running back upstairs to change for dinner. Pretty black patent heels, a silky black jacket, slim leg pants, and a sparkly bangle on my wrist. I twirled around in front of the mirror. You look like a nun, the voice was in my head. It was my mother's voice. She's been gone for years, but I carry her around in my memory. I smiled. No problem. Hadiza will be decked out like a peacock, splashy enough for the two of us. I found Hadiza outside the banquet hall, dragging a private event sign closer to the heavy oak doors. Mount Stephen Hall was in a quiet state of anticipation. The bright evening light bled the colors out of the soaring stained glass windows. The medieval chandeliers glittered and the pale stone floors gleamed. Flowers, silver and glassware crowded the tables. Everything sparkled waiting for the guests who would soon arrive. It's so beautiful, Hadiza, it's a shame to let them come in and mess it up. She laughed and grabbed my elbow, propelling me inside. Her long red skirt swished across the uh, stone floor. What a magnificent view, she said with a sigh. Outside, the gray-green mountains marched westward into the setting sun. Evie, after all that hassle, it was worth it. Hadiza made it sound like she'd organized the event single-handedly. Taking all the credit was one of her less endearing qualities. But after weeks of frantic calls from her staff, I knew she had dragooned every last one of them into service. This created havoc at the university. Hadiza, too, was a professor in the law department, and it was the end of term. Her admins were swamped. But the event had to be perfect. Finn was leaving the university. This was the last thing she could do for him. So that was that. Today, her mood verged on panic. All her staff were back in Calgary, leaving just the two of us to cope with the inevitable last minute snags, like the TV monitor that had inexplicably gone missing. But just so just how do you expect me to tell Finn's story without well, a monitor? She barked at the beleaguered hotel staffer who scuttled off to find one. Finn hated being the center of attention. For all I knew, he'd stolen it himself. Finally, everything was in place. We helped ourselves to a bottle of wine from the bar and ambled over to our table in front of the podium, our heels clicking softly on the pale stone floor. All we had to do was wait for the guest of honor to arrive. And of course, the guest of honor never does show up as we know from the very beginning, poor man's dying behind a dumpster at the Bam Springs Hotel. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's it for now, so thank you. Thank you, Susan. Are there thank any you. questions for Susan? I'll try my best to see any in the messages here too. Okay, none so far. All right, so we will come back to more questions at the end and we'll move to PD Workman. PD Workman 
is a USA Today bestselling author, winning winner of several awards from Library Services for Youth in Custody and the In Detail Magazine's Crowned Heart Award, and has published over 100 mystery, suspense, thriller, and young adult books. Workman loves writing about the underdog. She has been praised for her realistic details, deep characterization, and sensitive handling of the serious social issues that appear in all of her stories, from light cozy mysteries through to darker, grittier young adult and mystery suspense books. You can find her at pdworkman.com and on most social media as PD Workman author. So welcome, PD Workman. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to be reading from She Wore Morning, which is the first book in my Zachary Goldman uh, private investigator series. And book number 16 from that series is releasing this Friday. Uh, it also intertwines with the Kenzie Kirsch medical thriller series. Uh, there are seven out in that series right now and three more coming out next year. So between the two of them, there'll be 26 books. So if you like to binge read, uh, I've got lots of books for you. All right. So this is just from the blurb. Uh, a dead child, a mother deep in mourning. Private investigator Zachary Goldman's life isn't all roses, but he tries to put his own shattered life behind him to investigate the death of five-year-old Declan Bond. Declan's death has been ruled an accident, but his grandmother thinks there is more to it. She fears Declan's mother will not be able to find peace until Zachary can give them an answer once and for all. But as Zachary digs into the circumstances surrounding Declan's death, he finds that all is not as it seems and somebody doesn't want him to find the truth. Zachary Goldman stared down the telephoto lens of the subjects before him. It was one of those days that left tourists gaping over the gorgeous scenery, dark trees against crisp white snow with the mountains as a backdrop, like the picture on a Christmas card. The thought made Zachary sick, but he wasn't looking at the scenery. He was looking at the man and the woman in a passionate embrace. The pretty young woman's cheeks were flushed pink, more likely with her excitement than the cold, since she'd barely stepped out of, the car, out of her car to greet the man. He had a swarthier complexion and a thin black beard and was currently turned away from Zachary's camera. They thought they were alone, that no one could see them without being seen. They hadn't counted on the fact that Zachary had been surveilling them for a couple of weeks and had known where they would go. They gave him lots of warnings so that he could park his car out of sight, camouflage himself in the trees, and settle in to wait for their appearance. He was no amateur. He'd been a private investigator since she'd been choosing wedding dresses for her Barbie dolls. He held down the shutter button to take a series of shots as they came up for air and looked around at the magnificent surroundings, smiling at each other, eyes shining. Zachary's phone started to buzz in his pocket. He lowered the camera and turned around, walking farther into the grove of trees. He had the pictures he needed. Anything else would be overkill. He pulled out his phone and looked at it. Not recognizing the number, he swiped the screen to answer the call. Goldman Investigations. Uh, yes, is this Mr. Goldman? A voice inquired, older, female, with a tentative quaver. Yes, this is Zachary, confirmed, subtly nudging her away from the mister. Mr. Goldman, my name is Molly Hildebrandt. He hoped she wasn't calling about her 60-something-year-old husband and his renewed interest in sex. If it was another infidelity case, he was going to have to turn it down for his own sanity. He would even take a lost dog or wedding ring, as long as the ring wasn't on someone else's finger now. Mrs. Hildebrandt, how can Goldman Investigations help you? I don't know whether you've been following the news at all about Declan Bond, the little boy who drowned. Zachary frowned. He trudged back toward his car. I'm familiar with the basics, he hedged. A four or five-year-old boy whose round face and feathery dark hair had been pasted all over the news after a search for a missing child had ended tragically. They announced a few weeks ago that it was determined to be an accident. Zachary ground his teeth. Yes. Mr. Goldman, I was Declan's grandma. Her voice cracked. Zachary waited, listening to her sniffles and sobs as she tried to get herself under control. I'm sorry. This has been very difficult for me, for everyone. 
Yes. Mr. Goldman, I don't believe that it was an accident. I'm looking for someone who would investigate the matter privately. Zachary breathed out a homicide investigation of a child. He told himself he would take anything that wasn't infidelity, but if there was one thing that was more depressing than couples cheating on each other, it was the death of a child. I'm sure there are private investigators that would be more qualified for a homicide case than I am, Mrs. Hildebrand. My schedule is pretty full right now, which of course was a lie. He had the usual infidelities, insurance investigations, liabilities, and odd requests. The dregs of the private investigation business, nothing substantial like a homicide. It was a high profile case. A lot of volunteers had shown up to help, expecting to find a child who had wandered out of his own yard, expecting to find him dirty and crying, not floating face down in a pond. A lot of people had mourned the death of a child they hadn't even known existed before his disappearance. I need your help, Mr. Goldman, Zachary. I can't afford a big name, but you've got good references. You've investigated deaths before. Can't you help me? He wondered who, he sh who she had talked to. It wasn't like there were a lot of people who would give him a bad reference. He was competent and usually got the job done, but he wasn't a big name. I could meet with you, he finally conceded. I'm not making any promise at this point. Like I said, my schedule is pretty full already. She gave a little half sob. Thank you. When are you able to come? After he'd hung up, Zachary climbed into his car, putting his camera down on the floor in front of the passenger seat where it couldn't fall and started the car. For a while, he sat there staring out the front windshield at the magical, sparkling Christmas card scene. Every year, he told himself it would be better. He would get over it and be able to move on and enjoy the holiday season like everyone else who cared about his craft childhood experiences. People moved on. And when he'd married Bridget, he'd thought he was going to achieve it. They would have a fairy tale Christmas. They would have hot chocolate after skating at the public rink. They would wander down Main Street looking at lights and the crash in front of the church. They would open special, meaningful presents from each other. But they'd fought over Christmas. Maybe it was Zachary's fault. Maybe he had sabotaged it with his gloom. The season brought with it so much baggage. There'd been no skating rink, no hot chocolate, only hot tempers. No walks looking at the lights or the nativity. They'd practically thrown their gifts at each other, flounced off to their respective corners to lick their wounds and pout away the holiday. He'd still cherish the thought that perhaps the next year there would be a baby. What could be more perfect than Christmas with a baby? It would unite them, make them a real family, just like Zachary had longed for since he'd lost his own family. He and Bridget and a baby, maybe even twins, their own little family in their own little bubble. But despite a positive pregnancy test, things had gone horribly wrong. Zachary stared at the bright white scenery and blinked hard, trying to shake off the shadows of the past. The past was past, over and done. This year, he was back to batching it for Christmas. Just him and a beer and It's a Wonderful Life on TV. He put the car in reverse and didn't look into the rearview mirror as he backed up, even knowing about the precipice behind him. He deliberately parked where he'd have to back up toward the cliff when he was done. There was a guardrail, but if he backed up too quickly, the car would go right through it. And who could say whether it had been accidental or deliberate? Mrs. Hildebrand could testify that he'd been calm and sober during their call. It would be ruling, ru ruled an accident. But his bumper didn't even touch the guardrail before he shifted into drive and pulled forward onto the road. He'd meet with the grandmother. Then, assuming he did not take the case, there would always be another opportunity. Life was full of opportunities. All Thank right. you, Pamela. We already have a question from Eric. Are you going to give yourself a Christmas break from writing? <laughs> <laughs> well, no. <laughs> I'll take Christmas Day off. <laughs> yeah, I. Hmm, we're all, we all have that question sometimes when our office is right there at home, right? Uh, any other questions for Pam at this time? Okay, so we will go to our final reader for the evening, Jonathan Whitelaw. Jonathan is an award-winning author, journalist, and broadcaster. After working on the front line of Scottish politics, he moved into journalism covering everything from sports to music to radioactive waste and everything in between. He's a regular reviewer, podcaster, panelist, and commentator. Welcome, Jonathan. 
Thank you very much. I was going to thank you for that wonderful introduction, Julie, but it was me that wrote it, so I should I should probably, <laughs> probably thank myself. Um, I couldn't find the unmute button there. Uh, just just on that note about taking a day off at Christmas, my the edits for the book that I'm going to be reading from tonight dropped on the December 23rd last year. And uh, I'm nervously waiting on the edits for the next book coming. And they haven't arrived today. They're probably not going to arrive tomorrow or Thursday or Friday. I know it's going to be next week. And there we go. Christmas is ruined, <clears throat> he says. But Christmas to me is, uh, is always ruined because I'm there. There we go. Right. So um, enough of the waffle. Uh, thank you very much, Julie. Obviously, I'm sure the rest of us will uh, join me in this and thanking you for putting this together. Uh, particularly a very very busy time of the year um it's it's been great it's been wonderful for me i i've, I've been sitting here listening to all these wonderful authors and all this wonderful work and sort of forgot that uh, i've got to do my bit now um so i will be to, to, as a word of warning to everybody i will be bringing the tone completely down now um because it's been absolutely wonderful but yes thank you very much julian thank you to, to everyone else that's been here so um I'm reading from uh, The Village Hall Vendetta, which is the second in my Bingo Hall detective series, uh, and they're cosy mysteries, and they follow the misadventures of uh, Jason and Amita, a uh, mother-in-law and son-in-law uh, amateur detective duo who get up to their necks in trouble. Uh, Jason is an out-of-work journalist. Amita is a retiree who is very much a pillar of the local community. It's set in the Lake District in the UK. Um and that's that's about it. So we're, I'm going to read a little bit from chapter two, um, just to keep everybody on their toes, quite frankly. And uh, in, interestingly, uh, I think I've spoken to a couple of you guys about this, but the the chapter titles in the first bingo uh, book were all bingo calls from from the UK. So it's things like Kelly's Eye and Number Ten and stuff like that. And the um, there's a bit of a hidden Easter egg in this one, and nobody's got it yet. It came out in August, and if someone has got it, they've not got in touch with me. But there is a there's a hidden Easter egg in the chapter titles of this one. Um, there's a link between them, and I've said this to my editor. I've said this to everyone actually. It's by far and away the cleverest thing that I've ever done. Hand, I mean, it's, it was a fairly low it was a fairly low bar to start off with, but it's by and far the the cleverest thing I've ever done and I can't tell anyone about it until someone gets it undone by my own hubris whatever right so without further ado chapter two the blue window <clears throat> the champagne cork popped and the frothy fizz spilled over onto the little table between them Jason had only ever heard that sound for its own enjoyment a handful of times more often than not the bubbly was broken out by the big shots he was reporting on he was left with the machine bovril that always had a shimmering film on its surface. There you are, my boy, Bollinger. Drink up, drink up. Nothing but the best will do. Nil satis, nisi optimum, as they said in the ancient world. Hal Mulberry emptied half the bottle into two plastic flutes. He then took a long gulp from the bottle itself and laughed loudly. He was the type of man who, when he laughed, everyone around knew he was, it was happening. Big, boisterous, but still strangely likable, his open, ruddy face lit up the first-class cabin of the train as it sped from Euston Station. Do you know why I drink Bollinger, Jason? He asked. Because it's the most expensive, Jason asked back. No, 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 it's not. Not by a long shot. It's because James Bond drinks it. I remember watching Roger Moore in the cinema and he asked for Bollinger and that was it. I was sold. I told myself as I scoffed down my cheap crisps that when I grew up, that's what I was going to drink just like him. And here we are. Here we are, said Jason with a smile. This wasn't the first bottle that Hal had loosened off today wasn't even the first in the last hour. The celebratory mood was in the air. The local boy had done good and he was returning home with his prize. He'd bought Buttermere at dawn and was feeling pretty pleased with himself. That's a painting, by the way. Jason, on the other hand, was trying to feel professional. He was, after all, still working and no amount of expensive champagne and guffawing businessmen were going to distract him from doing his job. Unfortunately, Hal Mulberry was the type of man who made it very difficult to say no to. Over six feet tall with sparkly with a sparkly cheekiness and wicked good fun in his hazel eyes, he seemed to weave a sort of magic wherever he went. Jason liked him. He liked him a lot, especially when he was picking up the bar tab. I've got her, Jason. I've got her, he said, loosening his top button and tugging at his polka dot tie. Do you know how long I've been waiting for this moment? Have you any idea? I'd need to check my notes, Hal, but you might have mentioned that it's been a dream for 40 years in the making. 42 drained the plastic glass and went back to the bottle. 42 long, hard years of graft 
ducking and diving and every bloody thing else. It takes to scrounge up enough money to buy a masterpiece. But I'll tell you this, and I want this in your article. It's been worth every second, every single second, Jason, to be able to call that painting my own. Jason politely and subtly pushed his flute away from him. Pulling out his tatty notepad in the third pen of the day, he'd been chartering their journey since six this morning, down the spine of the country, through the bustling streets of London and every nerve-shredding, anxiety-inducing moment of the auction itself. Hal, Mar Hal Mulberry had regaled him with stories of his meteoric rise in business, a rags the richest story from potless school leaver in the 1980s to a thriving entrepreneur of the dot-com bubble in the 1990s. Every love, laugh and leer had been described in great detail. Yes, his family had historically had, historically had wealth, Mulberry's had been generous philanthropists in Cumbria in their day, but most of it had gone by the time Hal was born. So Hal had made his own pot of gold through hard work and intuition. And as the clock struck six in the evening, Jason felt like he'd lived all of Hal's 50 odd years with him. The art story he'd been reeled in, <laughs> he'd been reeled in with had now turned into an elaborate profile, a look at the ways and wonders of Hal Mulberry in his entirety. What he still didn't know, however, was why. Why would a successful businessman, the owner of an international import and export firm, drop £2 million on a work of art? That's what he was going to find out. I still can't believe it, said Hal, resting his head on the plush cushions of first class of his first class seat. The moment the gavel came down and those Sotheby snobs told me it was mine, it was like something out of a film. I can still hear the sound of my head. Can you hear it? I'm surprised you heard anything, said Jason. The amount of shouting and hollering you were doing in that auction room. I thought they were going to throw you out. They wouldn't dare, Hal grinned. I'd just given them a nice big chunk of change for commission. And if they threw me out, their bean counters upstairs would have a fit, a positive fit. Jason laughed at the thought. He'd rarely ever seen such joy in a person before. When the auctioneer had stiffly closed the sale and Hal's bid was victorious, he'd almost jumped out of his skin from the tycoon's outburst. The room had been busy, but as Jason had imagined it would be, and there had been plenty of interested parties. This, however, felt like it was destiny. Hal Mulberry was destined to own Bussemere at dawn, despite it being a little drab and conceptual for Jason's taste. It all looked more like ink blots and smudges to him, as opposed to the Buttermere he knew. Even the sky, to his mind, should have been at least blue instead of the grey and charcoal sweeps of the paintbrush. Now they were winging their way back up to Cumbria and on one of the early evening trains. Painting would be waiting for them, specially couriered that very afternoon, no expense spared, Hal had boasted. Jason was glad not to be sat beside it. He didn't imagine Hal Mulberry carried his own luggage very often. That would have left him holding a very expensive cargo. If his nerves had been shredded by the auction, just holding the painting probably would have finished him off. Now, I'm going to stop there because it starts to get into rather gritty detail. And of course, it wouldn't be a mystery novel without a murder and uh, not everything uh, that Hal Mulberry touches turns to gold. In fact, it turns rather bloody. Uh, in the next couple of chapters where Mr Mulberry meets a rather sticky end, premature sticky end, as it happens. Um, but yes, uh, it's available now. It's the next, the new one's out in uh, April, I think, in the UK. It's out in July here in Canada. Uh, I thoroughly enjoy writing the series. Um, and it's always good good fun to be able to sit down and, and, and write these, unless it's edits, unless it's Christmas time. <laughs> Not that I'm complaining, of course. Yeah, I, I, it, you'd be hard pressed to, to to find me complaining about something like that. Have I mentioned that I got my edits last December twenty third, and I'm expecting them next week, just before Christmas? I don't know if I've mentioned that. <laughs> so that I was going to ask you, the edits for the, that you're waiting for are for the third book, then? They are. They are. Um, yeah. So it's been. It's well. I mean, in fairness, it's been written since since August, I think. I think I, I think I sent it to, to the publishers um, in August. Uh, but the thing is, I'm a journalist, uh, or I was a journalist, um, as that rather well-written intro, uh, and, and it's spectacularly read intro, I should say, Julie. Um, it was a, it, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm used to edits, I'm used to editing work, and I used to be an online journalist, so everything had, had to happen, you know, like that. So mm -hmm. I can turn them around. 48 hours something like that so i'll maybe i'll stop for my turkey at, at christmas lunch and then start back i'm saying this like like i know that they're gonna arrive i mean they might not i might yeah. get lucky they might not arrive till the first week in january and then and then it's a different kind of anxiety because i sit and think oh my god they must be it must be so dreadful that they've waited till after christmas till i get it till i get the bad news i don't know so do you know that this is actually a real question then is it typical when you're working with a publisher like that that you don't actually know when you're going to get them 
even though you know the the launch date or the target launch date yeah i mean like this is this is my third book with harper collins and and i i get on splendidly with the team and and it's the same editor that i've had for all the bingo hall books um so you know she knows me she knows the writing she knows the character she knows the setting uh so i think there's probably a little a little bit of that i mean they always give you they always they always say that it'll be with you you know in a month's time or two months time or what have you but you know the thing is they've got they've got lots of authors they've got lots of books and things like that some some, some editors will, will be able to turn it around very very quickly and, and it, particularly if you are you know if you take longer to do the edits it also depends on how much edits have to be done I mean, I've had conversations with my editor be before before now, um, and she's very confidently said that, you know, it's nothing, it's not going to take anything massively structural to, to you know, we're not going to have to change okay. the ending, we're not going to have to move things about, we're not going to have to, you know, rewrite the first five chapters, what have you. It'll just be little things to, for want of a better expression, to polish the turd. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, any other questions? I sort of dominate there because I wanted to ask, but any other questions for Jonathan? See I do have a question for the for the group. I, yes. I, have, a, I have a question for a group. I, um, you know, where's where's all the where are all the Christmas sweaters? Where are all the Christmas jumpers? I dug this I'm one out. Sparkly. You're looking incredibly sparkly, yeah. Julie. <laughs> I dug this one out, especially for the uh, for the occasion. This only comes out at the at, at Christmas. It's like eggnog. Yeah, I'm wearing Christmas socks. I have candy cane socks. That's fine. That's uh, you, you got you got a pass then. You have Christmas <laughs> earrings here, a little bow. All right, okay. <laughs> and a reddish shirt. <laughs> Very festive. Yeah, maybe if we, I mean, I would like to do um, more online events, obviously, before next uh, December. But if we do a festive one, maybe next year, we should require some kind of bad sweater by all the <laughs> readers. I, well, I'm make, the thing make is, everybody I'm get reindeer antlers at the dollar store. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's it. I, it's it's a celebration for me. This is my last event of 2023. I had to try and think what the name what the, what the name what the <laughs> year was. Yeah. That's how exhausted I am. So it's a celebration for me. This is it. Yes, yeah. until the edits come back. <laughs> yeah. If I mentioned my edits might come back next week before Christmas, <laughs> I said that. <laughs> okay. Um, any other comments from anybody? Questions, comments, general discussion points? Um, raise your hand, type in them. Okay. We, you know what? I was prepared to have to deal with an unruly audience, but apparently this is a very subdued audience. So we are good. <laughs> Jonathan's so, uh, putting up his hand. Oh, sorry. John, go, I know. Go me ahead. again. Sorry. Yeah. Me again. No, I, <laughs> actually, Susan, I, I was going to ask uh, Susan a question about this. Um, like I, I'm really, really intrigued by the the idea of having two sisters uh, as the uh, you know in in the sort of central character uh, point. Was that you know what was the like uh, as I can explain with my book, you know that sort of fam fam familial disharmony that you always associate with a sort of in law and and, and mother in law son in law traditionally. Um, I always have really, really good fun with that, uh, and and it was one of the reasons that I that I picked it as the as that sort of central relationship with the two with the two detective so to speak but i'm always interested when it when it comes to particularly families at the heart of stories and at the heart of mystery novels in particular um what the again what the sort of you know what the what the thinking was behind it and and if you have any sisters do you get on or not get on the same way that your characters do yeah so i'm the eldest of four and right. I, i'm really close to my my second sister the ones just after me and um, uh, what I find with sisters is that uh, that they can complement each other. And as you said, they can, you can always have that friction, especially if they're close in age. So with with uh, the two sisters in this book, the the Evie's the older one, and yet the one that sends, seems to have a bit more grounding is her sister uh, Louisa, who's a nurse. And uh, the nice thing about using Louisa is she can actually bring in all sorts of medical stuff or stuff that helps uh, Evie understand what really happened here. So, you know, how you use characters some, sometimes to just try to help clarify the plot or to, to explain things that the ordinary person might not know. So I can use Louisa that way, but also she's she's better grounded and they have a, they have a lightness to them that I, I like a lot. You know, I, I, I just think that um, family is important. And, and if you can find a way to, to grab that a bit in your stories, that's good. And that, that's where that came from.
Actually, I want to ask the question back then to you, Jonathan. You were talking about the the relationship with the father, the um, the in laws. Is that based on anything personal, or is that just your sense of how that relationship would work? The the amount of times, Susan, I've been asked since these books came out in last year, uh, mm -hmm. is that is is it you and your mother in law that's at the, the center of it? And do you know, if I was if I was being completely honest. Uh, yes, in some respect, I think I said this. I think I said this at one of the panels that um, I've, I've definitely got a record saying it before. But the inspiration for this book came when I was over. My mother-in-law's Northern Irish, and we were over at hers years ago for Easter, and we were sitting watching TV. And this old Irish pop star whose name escapes me um, came on, and I don't know where it came from. Bolt of lightning out of the blue. I looked over to my my mother-in-law Margaret, and I said, "What would happen if?" she was murdered and you and I had to catch the killer. <laughs> oh my and goodness. Instantly, instantly my Margaret came back and said there would be two other murders, Jonathan, namely yours and mine, long before we got anywhere near catching who was actually <laughs> responsible for killing the, the pop star. And that was it. That was honestly that was that 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 was that was a that was the that was the inspiration for it. So I mean there's elements of Amateur that the a uh, the one in law character that there there may be sort of you know exaggerated as to what Margaret's mm -hmm. like and and Jason being a journalist, you know, the, the good thing about that was that you know, I was a journalist for 12 years. So all the all the sort of you know journalistic knowledge, exactly as you say, um mm -hmm. Susan, you know, having someone there that knows that you can't just go about accusing people of murder and knows that you know there's that you can prejudice cases by things that can be published if it's a live, you know, if someone's been arrested, you know, having that sort of prerequisite knowledge that that that's on tap by one of the characters, it it, it made sense. Um, but I mean, the, 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 there's there's one there's one thing that's directly lifted from my mother-in-law. So in in the bingo books, uh, Jason, um joshes his mother-in-law by nicknaming her the sheriff of penrith penrith's the town in cumbria that they're that they're from um and he uses it, it yeah it's a term of effect of you know of endearment but it's also it, it, it implies that she has her nose in everyone's business uh, mm -hmm. which she does of course but you know she she doesn't see herself as as being that sort of busybody which of course she is um and my mother-in-law's nickname where she in the, the tiny little fishing village in Northern Ireland that she lives in is the sheriff of Mahri. It's called Mahri, the name of the town. Um, and I thought that's perfect. That's 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 absolutely perfect. So that's that's been taken. Uh, I think my mother-in-law, I think Margaret sees more of herself in amateur than 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 I do, which is mm -hmm. which is fine, which is fine, right? It's the first book's dedicated to her. Yeah, I've got that up there. First book's dedicated to her, and I didn't tell her. Um, and it, it was out a week. Uh, before she got it and I like you know the first day probably publication day came out I didn't hear anything from her other than you know congratulations and all the rest of it second day nothing third day fourth day nothing mm -hmm. so it got to like a week after after publication day and I said uh did you see anything you know anything in the book that you particularly liked anything you know anything that you, you enjoyed sort of near the start right right at the beginning and she said, "Oh no, I haven't got it yet, Jonathan. That's uh, it's it's on my it's on my to do list." So, <laughs> so my wife went my wife went ballistic, mm -hmm. um, so she went out she went out that that day and she got it. And of course, I got this gushing uh, gushing phone call from her thanking me very very much for it being dedicated to me. And of course, in typical Northern Irish fashion, um, that sort of salt of the earth humor. She it, it you know she thanked me and in the same breath went. Oh my God, Jonathan! What's your mother gonna think when she sees that the book's dedicated to me and not to her? Oh, uh, so that's cute. You can't, you can't win, right? You can't yeah. win. <laughs> that's delightful. That is delightful. A uh, question from Eric: In the spirit of Susan's retiring, Professor, do any of you think that you'd ever retire from writing? Anybody? I don't know how to do anything else. That's mm -hmm. the that's the sad part about it. I don't much want to do anything else. Again, that's the, that's the other sad part about it. It's a good question, though. I haven't really thought about it. I don't know. I I, I guess it's, it's one of these. I, I'm sure that I'm sure the rest of the guys would echo this. It's like you know, you've always got ideas for stuff. Mm -hmm. you, some sometimes you've got too many ideas to the point where you start something, you get mm -hmm. ten thousand words in, twenty thousand words in, and think. Well, oh, what about that other thing that I was thinking about the other day? There, shall I just start that? And suddenly you've amassed. You know, millions and millions of words in twenty thousand word chunks. So it's does yeah. Maybe before I I consider retiring, I should go back and finish all of that stuff. Right. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I don't think I ever would, but I might just write smaller stuff if I didn't have the 
you know, the time or the energy to do more. But I think I'd always want to do something. I'm always thinking up stories. I can't I can't imagine retiring. And I was just thinking about uh, PD, uh, PD, Pamela, uh, and with how, with how prolific you are, I can't imagine how you would stop because I don't, I don't know how you find all the hours to get all those books written. But, uh, you know, they're obviously really good books. And I don't know how you would be able to shut that off. Yeah, I, I worry about health issues when I get older or that kind of thing. You know, I, I can see that if there was, you know, Alzheimer's or that kind of thing, and I can't remember the beginning of the book, then that could cause <laughs> issues. But, <laughs> so you but I hope to too. keep running. Yeah, I, I hope to keep writing for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, Tony, you had your hand up. I think you're on mute, though. You're yeah, I think you're on mute, so we can't hear you. While he's figuring out his mute button, um, I, this is actually kind of a second career for me. So, uh, no, I think I'll just write until I can't. And I'm with Jonathan. I have too many ideas. So this year was about get the ones done that were already started. Um, yeah, I, I, I now that it, it was a lot of work at first, but now that I've got it going and I've got my flow, I think for me, I'll just keep doing this. There won't be anything else after this. Tony. Mm -hmm. I think we can I'm just going to say I already retired once, um, yeah. but the I discovered writing uh, and writing fiction, which is very different from the things that I've been writing before. Um, and I found it liberating and exhilarating. Uh, so it's not something I want to give up, up easily or quickly. I concur. Mm -hmm. Any other? These are good questions. Thank you, everybody. Any other questions, comments? complaints i heard somebody might get some edits on december 23rd i was <laughs> just gonna say that <laughs> let's all pray for him that he doesn't well i just want to say he that does or that he doesn't well i think well, he does i mean the does thing is it's sore. like is it is it better to get he, them before christmas or is it better to not have them and still be worrying about them over christmas and then you know kick off the year on a on a downer <laughs> you see there's the either way it's going to be a struggle Mm -hmm. okay i'm just gonna say uh thank you everybody for coming this was really successful we had some great readings tonight we had some great questions and really good uh attendance uh definitely uh i think this could be a very successful thing going forward especially given uh, our challenge with people being in some of the smaller places and can't come to the live events so thank you everybody